Lelouch v. Britannia commands you, all of you, listen to this podcast. But, uh, uh, that, that only works if you have eye contact. Shut up! <laughs> Hello and welcome to Shred Cells episode 60. I'm your host, Alex Schmitz, and with me here today is Andrew Gleason. As always, although I wasn't on last week, so <laughs> I guess I'm, we've broken my streak. It's true. And new member to the podcast, uh, Trenton. How do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Prater. Trenton Prater. There we go. All right, so um, since you're a new member, Trenton, uh, new member to Tech Ed's freshman here at Ohio University, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your year major, and how you got into anime? Uh, well, um, like you said, I'm a freshman, and I'm currently enrolled at the Scripps College of Communication. Um, currently, no um, emphasis area for my major, but I do plan on going into video production. Um, I don't really have a lot to say about myself. Uh, uh, I'm kind of from the area, about half, I live half an hour away, um, I'm a commuter, so it's a lot cheaper that way, a lot cheaper than leaving on, uh, living on campus, so I imagine that's true. It is. Yeah, um, how I got into anime, uh, I had a very interesting combination of shows that got me into anime. First, it was High School of the Dead. <laughs> oh, of course. One, one heck of a starter a show I, that's a thing i've not seen that show but i've seen clips from I've it seen, to know what it is i watched the first episode and then i was like um you see i feel like you should just commit to a show <laughs> <laughs> just go full porn yeah, seriously like it really is like as close to the border as things can possibly get like it's just as subtle as kill a kill but kill a kill like has points to it right uh, uh, kill a kill yeah, right. it's absolutely crazy and uh yeah I, uh, but well, it's thing. directed by the same guy who did uh, Death Note and Attack on Titan, so it's got great production values. That is yeah. an interesting pedigree. Um, <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. And after I watched that, um, after a friend recommended that to me, uh, I just went randomly on Netflix, found an anime show called Angel Beats. Oh, and yes. Angel Beats. We did that for the last year. That was fun. Yes. Yeah, that it, was actually two years ago. Was it two years ago? I whatever. think so. I don't remember things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically, I have two different shows, just completely different from each other, yeah, those and pretty it, different. Yeah, you kind of you kind of see. I, I was able to see like the craziness of anime, but also see kind of the better, more tame. Uh, you know, mm, yeah, well written, serious, well written, <laughs> well written. Although Angel Beach is not the most serious affair in the universe, uh, so no, uh, not really. They had, but they had those like ejector desk chairs, so yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons it was good. It balanced the comedy with the drama. There was a lot of drama. But I'm that. I'm curious. Uh, did you get some feels with the last episode? I got mm-hmm. feels with both the last episode and the episode of a few episodes before that with the whole um, pink haired girl Yui. Yeah, with yeah. that whole scene and. There's a lot of things that got the feels. Yeah. While Angel Beats is definitely a very flawed show in a lot of ways, I still love it to pieces. It's really good. Mm. I yeah. do like it a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, in case you didn't know, if you haven't been listening to us for a while, we're actually a part of Tech Eds here, which is part of ABW Productions, a media production organization here at Ohio University. We are Tech Eds with all sorts of cool things with video games, movies, music, anime, podcasts. We have a blog. We got a website, uh, YouTube page, you know, iTunes. We're pretty cool. And we're here today to talk about the anime Code Geass. Uh, but before we dive into that, we're going to talk about a little bit of news and the animation we've watched since last time. Uh, news-wise, there hasn't been much um, since... I mean, we just did a podcast last week, so there hasn't been much since then. I did just see uh, today there was a short teaser release for the Psychopaths movie, just like a 20-second long thing. But I forgot they're going to the movie. Um, yeah, no, it has me pretty excited. I, I imagine. And uh, let's watch that. Kenny and Claire and I are actually going to watch this first episode of the second season after the podcast. Oh. I'm pretty excited. That is exciting. Yes, it is. I like, caught up on it. I would have totally joined it, but I have <laughs> but no... But you didn't, did I you? I haven't. Hey, hey, Kokios has consumed so much of my anime <laughs> watching time. That's true. Fair enough. Podcasts comes first after all i uh, see there you go i figured you'd like that <laughs> um then uh also just today actually there was a trailer for tomorrowland which is being directed by brad bird the guy who directed the incredibles um so that was Wait. live action oh i was really saying like i thought that was live action it is okay but it looked it looked pretty good you know. Oh, wait. Are we just talking about any movies? Or well, <laughs> Brad Bird is a famous animation director, so yeah. I thought it was relevant. Also, Fine. it was a slow news week, so I'm kind of grasping at strings here. 
<laughs> I'm just saying that should be on my podcast. So. Oh, so I'm stealing from your podcast. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah, you're <laughs> jacking my podcast. Okay. And also, uh, there was actually New York Comic Con apparently was today, and uh, Big Hero it 6 is. had a new trailer. Yeah. Showed off a little bit of new footage. I need to read the news from that, actually. Um, and, so comic books. and also, there was um, they, uh, they are actually pretty cool. They did a live stream of the Korra panel. This is apparently going to be like the last Legend of Korra panel, you know, that they'll probably ever do because the show is coming to an end. Yeah. But they actually showed the, the second episode. So I've seen the second episode before it airs what? online on Saturday. And uh, it was awesome. Uh, showed Korra recovering, and we saw Toph. And it was awesome. Oh, she's in the second episode already? She is in the second oh, episode. Oh, yeah. Nice. A lot of that stuff from the trailer is in, like, the first two episodes, oh. Oh, as right. it turns yeah. out. That's a that's a lot of stuff, actually. Uh, yes, it is. It's a lot of ground they're covering. So, it was good, though. Uh, and it was also nice. You know, they had some, like, tearful goodbye sort of things, you know. Yeah. So, that's that was all good. Sorry, right, the second episode, though. How can we do we're doing so much tearful goodbye? Well, what are we going to do at the end of the show? I'm talking about the actors and the directors oh, saying that. goodbye to the, the oh, fans. Yeah. You yeah. Know. Well, yeah, well, unless they want to do another show. Well, I'm Maybe. sure they will, but it may not be Avatar. I mean, I, I'm not expecting another Avatar show for quite some time. I imagine not, no. Unless Nickelodeon gets dollar signs in their eyes. and Yeah, they, but the fact one. that they take Takor off the air would make me think they probably aren't that interested in a new show it in the immediate future. It definitely seem that way. Yeah. yeah. But uh, talking about the animation we watched since last time, um, I've actually been watching a good bit because the new season of anime has started. So, like, I've been watching some of these new shows, and actually, I've been surprised. There have been several really good ones that I've actually really enjoyed. Uh, first, primarily one, perhaps being uh, Fate Stay Night. First episode came out. <gasps> Wait, that did start. It did. Oh my god, I'm gonna go home and watch that. I was actually just talking to Trent earlier. He was talking about how he hasn't seen Fate Zero yet, but it's on his watch I list. Loved Fate Zero. I watched it over summer. It was awesome. I'm watching that when I go home. <laughs> yeah, no Fate, and it was a uh, it was actually an hour long episode, oh. uh, kind of like Fate Zero did. So oh. it was pretty, it was kind of slow paced, but the action at the end was awesome. Like it it has the potential to look even better than Fate Zero. Let's awesome. put it that way. Um, quick question, because do you have to watch Fate Zero to watch Fate Stay Night? Like no, this version. Okay. No, I well, mean, then. and part of the first episode is introducing to the idea of the Holy Grail War and all that. Well, so. then I'm gonna yell at my roommates to watch it with me. So <laughs> yeah, no, I would recommend it. Very good. Uh, what else did I watch? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Selector Spread Recross, sequel to a show from a couple seasons ago, and the new Gundam show. Uh, they brought Gundam back? Oh, yeah. Well, there's been, I mean, there's been a, um, Gundam Build Fighters has been going for the past few seasons. That's one with, like, where the Gundams are toys, and, like, they fight with them in, like, virtual arena things. But in doing that, they get to, like, show off, it's like, custom-able. all the old Gundams, custom-able. like, from any, any, uh, any generation, basically. Just make a custom Robo show. I miss custom <laughs> Robo. That was that a good was a, game. That was a good series. I missed it. I games. remember. But uh, also needs me I'm not really that much of a Gundam fan, but I watched this one because it's called Gundam Reconquista, and it's apparently uh, directed uh, by the original creator, which is the first time he's been on the show in, like, a long time. Since the first show? Well, no. Since, like, uh, early 2000s. Yeah. But uh, it was good but weird. Like, I really mm. don't know what to feel about it right now. I don't know how to feel. Basically. Uh, there was also one I really liked um, called Lion April, which is like a music romance show, and the main chick uh, played the trumpet theme from How or from uh, Castle in the Sky. Oh, I was gonna say, I'm like, is this just turning into Kids on the Slope? No, quickly? no, it's, it's not quite. It's not Kids on the Slope. Okay. Because Kids on the Slope was more of a bromance than a romance. Hey, there was plenty of romance. <laughs> there was like a love. There was a love triangle. No, there was a love triangular prism at one point. It, it, I'm not denying that there are love triangles, but in the end, it was a show about friendship because the love, spoilers, love doesn't work out well, in that I show. Well, I know, but that's because of stupid reasons. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, whatever. Uh, Log Horizon 2 had its first episode, which, Trent, you mentioned you're a fan of that show. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's you should try that sometime okay. if you like like politics and economics I and love a fantasy. Well, then you love the show. <laughs> they I conquer, love game, anime Game of Thrones. They conquer uh, economics in that show with hamburgers. I'm not even lying. Okay, yeah. maybe but, less than two. No, it's than, awesome. No Trust joke. Me. That's like the fixer for everything. That's how they s- literally fix everything was with the hamburgers and they just build on so from there. So is this like the second season of the show? This is the second season. Okay. It's on sh- right now. I will look into it. Um, yep. And uh, there was one called Shiro, Shiro Bako, which is like um, about a bunch of girls in a 
actual anime production company. So it's basically showing a bunch of behind the scenes stuff with like, you know, she's running to people's houses to get the keyframes, you know, running back so they can give them to the director so they can go do like the voice recording session in oh, time. That's actually kind of it, amusing. Actually. I'm, I'm interested in the production aspect of anime. So that looks like one I'm definitely going to enjoy. Uh, and then there was one called um, Rage of Bahamut, which was like a, uh, uh, yeah, it's like an epic fantasy action thing done by the studio that made Terror and Resonance last season. So it looks like really awesome animation wise. I'm, so I'm pro this. I'm just going to make a bunch of Final Fantasy jokes the entire time if I watched it, though. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, maybe I'll send you the first episode because it was really good. So yeah. those are all ones I've been watching and enjoying so far. Uh, Andrew, how about you? All right, so Code Geass consumed all of my anime watch time and most of my video game playing time this last week. <laughs> so thank you, you for that. But you co- you sort of procrastinated it, to be fair. I, yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> Smash Brothers. <laughs> anyway, Smash Brothers. Smash Brothers. <laughs> so the only thing, I, the only animation we watched was when I watched, I watched Korra, right. obviously, which was really good. Yes, it um, was. I'm actually, Kovira is my new favorite villain in that series. <laughs> She's Already. only been in one episode. Already, uh, Already no. in love. Um, I don't know. Zaheer is cooler than her for now. I'm not saying she couldn't prove well, to be better. that's because Zaheer had a whole season. So well, to become Kavir awesome. will get a whole season. You're and, te- it, called- and, he's, and she's starting off like when the head starts. Okay. She, she's she got a good start. I will give her that. She could very well be the best she villain. She could. I mean, and, and she could also, this could also pin around to something awful, and I might not like her by the end of the season. But like, we'll see. We'll see. And then we watched Rebels. That yes, was we thing. did. It was good. I like Rebels, um, though. Fun fact: Did you hear the news? Um, uh, apparently, the uh, that that one-hour special is being rebroadcast on ABC, like near the end of the month, mm-hmm. and they're adding in a scene with the Inquisitor talking with Darth Vader, voiced by, by James. James Old, yeah, I did jo- hear about that. Part. James Earl Jones. I was like, and yes. that sounds awesome to me. Yes, yes, so. all of the yes. Um, yeah. Okay. But those are pretty much all I watch anime. Why? Fair enough, Trenton. How about you? Uh, I haven't really been watching much. Uh, I have this bad habit of watching the first episode when uh, new shows come out and then it's kind of laying it off until it's fully finished and then marathoning it later. So oh, That's how we watch Kill the Kill, or at least sections of Kill the Kill. We used to watch it in chunks. Yeah, I don't understand I don't doing know. it in we chunks. Did, we don't understand it either. You gotta go um, all or nothing. Either watch it week to week or just wait till it's over. Well, because some of the Kill the Kill episodes, like if they had a good cliffhanger, we came back that day but if it didn't have a good cliffhanger we might have waited like two or three weeks and then watched them all at once and then they would have a good cliffhanger and then we'd get really i angry. just find that amazing because when we talked on the podcast all of us loved kill a kill to death kill so kill. i don't understand why you didn't we watch it weekly. Loved, well part of it was that we couldn't watch it when our other room was home because we were yeah <laughs> concerned uh, about that but now we're showing it to him so i guess it really all of our fears were unfounded though we have corrupted him a lot more since, <laughs> since then <laughs> so <laughs> But no, I totally I, I sympathize with your problem. Yeah, uh, basically, uh, there's one show I can't I can hardly remember the names of any of them because it's been a while. But one of them was Sasami San at some email address. It's this really weird show. That sounds um, familiar. Yeah, basically it starts off this about a uh, uh, a girl a shut in who's living at home and she spies on people at her school with cameras and then. The episode seems, you know, normal enough, I guess. And then suddenly the whole world is chocolate. Everything <laughs> turns to chocolate. And then these three girls, suddenly one with a sword, one with magical powers, and another one who's apparently an android of some sort because she fires rockets out of her back. And, and I, I, all this is going on with some smooth jazz rock, and they're fighting off the chocolate monsters or whatever. And I'm like, how did this happen? It just, it just sort of just goes on and it doesn't explain anything fun fact well, i uh i saw some clip of because uh, i was looking at, like some you know pretty animation like on a video on youtube and i saw a clip from that show i was like oh that looks really good so i went and w- kind of watched the first episode and uh just to get to that cool animation the fight scene near the end and that's a episode or that's a show done by studio shaft actually the monogatari uh, uh studio so yeah. that's why it's got that really crazy visual style yeah, it, it looks like their work so yeah, I can I can definitely see the similarities, and then there was another show, uh, something about Survival Club. Oh, um, Sabagebu, not, not yeah. Fight Club. Yeah, that that's a uh, one from last season. It's about like an airsoft club with these girls, but like they have a narrator who like totally breaks the fourth wall all the time, and they make a lot of references like to American movies and stuff. And the main character is actually a horrible person, so all those things actually made that show quite fun. It's yeah. a good comedy. Oh, I've totally forgotten. I'm, I'm excited to finish it. Okay. 
I what? still have a transformation. I also watched this thing. It was a little witch academia. Oh, you hadn't seen that before? I had not seen it, and somebody showed it to me. Um, yeah, that's a uh, fun fact. That's from Studio Trigger, you know, yeah. Kill a Kill, uh, directed by Yo-Yo Shinari, who's a really good animator. With yeah, you know, it was really cool. And I was like, oh, yeah, was actually, really adorable. that's one I forgot to mention. Uh, there's a show, the English title is When Supernatural Battles Become Commonplace. It's the new uh, show from Trigger, actually. Everyone was I thinking they were doing a thing. Yeah, no, they are. Everyone, well, it's not original. It's based on a light novel, and like yeah. just looking at the picture, it's like really generic because it's like four girls and a guy, you know. So it looks like the most generic light novel thing in the world, but uh, it was actually like really funny, and like they had references. Like at one point, a, the girl punched the main guy with the red boxing gloves with the life fibers from <laughs> Kill a Kill. And it, it made some funny jokes with, like, these people randomly getting superpowers and, like, how that would work and all that. Mm. So it was actually surprisingly good. Yeah. Cool. So now that we've talked about the animation we've watched since last time, we're going to dive into this show, which is Code Geass, as I mentioned before. A 2006 sh- show done by Sunrise, completely original product, which is pretty rare in anime. Directed by Goro Tanaguchi and written by Ichiro Oku- Okuchi. Um who, you know, did both those roles on the, you know, both seasons of the show. They're really like the showrunners, the one who came up with the original concept and, you know, drove the story through to the end. Uh, And personally, I'm not going to lie, Code Geass is one of my all-time favorite shows, so I, like, have a extreme love for this uh, show, although we're only going to be talking about the first season today. We're going to be doing R2, like, two weeks from now. Yay. Yeah. So um, why don't we dive into our conversation with talking about the first episode, because uh, early on, the show sort of shows you the kind of style Code Geass f- goes for in that, like, it throws tons of stuff at you really fast-paced where, like, a scene will last five seconds and it'll cut away to something else. Yeah, they do have a tendency to do that. And I wonder I wonder if anybody's ever counted the number of times that a character says something and then it cuts something else and they're interrupted mid-sentence, because that happens all the time in the show. Oh, all the time. <laughs> and it's like, sometimes it's effective and sometimes it's just annoying, but I, it I love it for what it is. Um, I don't know, Andrew, this was your first time watching it the show. Was. So what were you, what was your impression of the first episode? All right, so the first episode, let me see if I can remember that far back. Um, <laughs> the first episode I remember liking a lot because actually, I actually did see the first episode twice because I did watch the first couple episodes years ago and then... That's yeah. right, you mentioned it, that. And then I just didn't watch it. Um, I, mean, I always meant to, and then it was like, well, I'll do that later. Um, I liked it a lot. I thought it was, I mean, it was very fast-paced, like you said, and it's, but they do a really good job of introducing Lelouch's character, I think. Um, they give him the Gios. I I seriously, the first time I saw him, I'm like, he's evil, right? Because <laughs> look how evil he looks. He looks. Yeah, he doesn't really hide it too evil. much. Um, and then, like, the first action he does when he gets his su- magic superpowers is he makes a squad of soldiers commit suicide. And I'm like, well, But then. soldiers that were about to kill him. I know, but still, like, you don't get to claim hero status when you get to control people's minds. And the first thing you do is make a bunch of people kill themselves. That's true. He well, could have just commanded, stop. Yeah, I mean, however you want to think of Lelouch, it's hard to think of him as a hero. Now, he's, he's kind of, you could think of him as, like, you know, he's the villain protagonist. So he's kind of like an anti-villain, you know, or anti-hero maybe. But he's I, not a straight hero by any stretch I, of the I, means. I would go with anti-villain? Um, right. That's a, that's a term. Like um, a villain who goes up against worse villains. A villain who goes against worse villains. Um, and he does do some good things throughout the show. Um, and then, you know, there's always the, well, I'm totally justified because I'm murdering everybody for my sister. So <laughs> <laughs> well, that he, justifies everything. He wasn't a... Uh, but he wasn't always sort of um, this kind of cold-hearted and uh, basically a murderer. Like within the first couple episodes, you kind of see that it, if the deaths of those he's killed so far affect him kind of personally. And then it yeah. slowly stops affecting him yeah. more yeah. and more. But he wins these battles. Going so. off of that, actually, with the first episode, you'll notice after they shoot themselves, he kind of looks at the blood with kind of like wider eyes. And then in episode three, he remembers how he shot Clovis. And he like goes and throws up in the bathroom. Yeah, no. You know, so I, like early on, he's like still, you know, not totally ready for it. He's adjusting to this. Um, then we see um, C two. She's she dies, and yeah. then she's in the OP. And then you're like, well, then I guess she's not really dead. So, <laughs> but of course not. <laughs> and then Suzaku, who is my favorite character in the show. Oh, really? Uh, I love Suzaku, although. I did watch the first two episodes of season two, and I'm starting to think that that's not going to be a trend that's going to keep going. Um, yeah. You'll, 
It'll be interesting to see Watch R2. I'll just put it there. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk about that yeah. in two weeks. But one thing I do love that with that first episode is, like I said, it is so frantic, but it really establishes the whole idea of, you know, uh, Japan being taken over by Britannia, being renamed Eleven, you know, the resistance mm. to Britannia, you know, the nightmare frame. was like all these things are thrown at you, yeah. and it does a pretty good job, even though it is a very exposition-heavy episode, for sure. It does. Um, it establishes the... It does establish all three of the nations that are not Oceania, not East Eurasia, not West Eurasia. Well, I mean, the, the main combatants are Japan, Br- Britain, Britannia, I should say, but totally Britain, but totally uh, Britain. <laughs> the the EU and uh, China, the Chinese Federation. Those are like the main superpowers yeah, but, in the you show. You know, Oceania, uh, Central Eurasia and East Eurasia. Right. From and 1984, I, but I, whatever. I don't, I don't think this is ever actually mentioned in the show, but a, the backstory to this is basically Britannia is if Britain won the war with the colonies, you know, back in. It's strongly hinted at, especially once the show becomes a very, I don't know. I mean, I always saw it as like a pro U.S. thing by the end. Once he establishes the United States of Japan about freedom and equality for all people, regardless of race, religion, or creed. And I'm like, oh, so it's you just want to be the United States. But then at the same time, when uh, Emperor Charles gets up there and talks about how, you know, we here at Britannia, we compete, we struggle, and in the end, we will conquer the world sort of thing. It's sort of like, you know, American capitalism, you know, the strong, you know, well, do no, work think, your way to success sort of thing. I think that's, I think that's thing. more of a, a stab against, like, imperialism in general. I oh, mean, yeah. Because, you know, the British were very imperialistic for a while. I mean, the sun never used to set on the British Empire, and now... Now not so much. <laughs> now, now, now not so much, but, like, it's very pro... It's very against like imperialism but it seems very pro like american ideals yeah well i suppose you could see certainly some in the rebellion you know against britannia being similar to the rebellion against you know britain with the colonies and all that sort of stuff Mm. um trenton what are your thoughts on the first episode of the show um basically uh kind of the same as you guys uh I like how it it sets up the fast pace because it shows how things are kind of hectic right now with uh, there's a resistance in Japan fighting back against uh, Britannia and uh, it it sets up everything very well, very quickly, and you kind of get a firm grasp of what's going on even though though it throws a lot at you. And it it definitely helps in the uh, next couple episodes as you kind of see... how all the characters are starting to get in their places. Like, you know, what kind of roles they're going to play in the show. And seeing a bit of backstory between... Uh, like getting to know a bit more about uh, Zuzaku and Lelouch's history as well. Mm-hmm. So Because you have that whole scene in the very beginning of the episode of, of them as children. Yeah, and, and you see C2's back in that as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you pay attention. Uh, well, and another thing I like about like the early episodes, because like in episode one, you know, he says the only ones who should kill are those prepared to be killed. And like pretty early on, he says, you know, I will destroy the world and make it anew. You know, like these sort of arc words, you know, the, the phrases that show up again and again in the show, you know, they establish those early on, which I think, you know, is pretty cool. Yeah, um, that, that's good. It's just a level of planning. I know mm. in the past you've talked about how you don't seem to like Code Geass and its depiction of chess. All right. It, it bothers me a lot less to actually watching the show, but I feel like it still gets on my... It's not even as prevalent. Like, it's kind of... The chess metaphor kind of goes away halfway through the show, halfway through the first season. Yeah. They really yeah. just don't do it anymore. And I'm like, oh, okay, so that's good. Uh, I, I think it's because at this point, I, the audience gets what's going on, that okay. it's all strategy and tactics. and Which is where the show is really its strongest is when, you know... The mind he's, games. He's playing mind games. He's doing tactics. He's being. He's doing a zero thing. He's doing the politics game. He's just really good at that stuff. Like that's where the show really shines. I'm really like invested in it the most. I always like to compare uh, his zero persona to basically a Japanese Batman in a way. Yeah, <laughs> Batman. He really kind of is. Uh, he okay. wants justice. Justice. I'm. I'm okay with that. Yeah, because like once again, second episode, you know, you see him maneuvering the Black Knights against. Uh, Clovis's forces, you know, moving them like chess pieces, you know, and doing these these tactics, you know, to win the day, you know. So early on, it establishes like what I agree with you. Like, although I do love the 
while the fight scenes are awesome and they're well animated, and I actually do quite like the design of the mechs in that they don't look like your typical Gundam mech number seven, you know, like most mech shows, like they have more of original design. So the action in the show is really good, but the part that really makes it great is the tactics, the mind games, the strategy, you know, all those things are what I really love about the show as well. That's what draws me into it. Um, and, and you can also start to see how all that starts to affect the characters sort of, you know, personally, like how it kind of breaks them down knowing like, okay, this is how, this is how, how, how they're going to react to the next situation basically. Yeah. Uh, One other thing we should probably talk about is that the character designs for the show were done by Clamp, which is a group of manga authors that do uh, things like uh, XX Holic and Tsubasa Chronicles, and they have a very distinctive look for their characters where they have very thin legs and arms, you know, these interesting Mm. kind of body proportions. And I know some people don't like it, and in some cases I don't like it, but for whatever reason, I think it actually suits Code Geass very well. It looks good. It does, and... uh, so, but of course, certain movements that the characters have look a little weird at some points. Yeah, and, like uh, sometimes when they run, it maybe looks a little unnatural. It, it yeah. does. Uh, a little very also, stickish. very important thing that they establish in the first episode is Suzaku and his uh, uh, love of kicking, or spinning, I should say, Spinzaku. Spin kicking. <laughs> yes, because he does that to Lelouch, like, first time they meet after, you know, God knows how many years. He kicks him in the face. It's great. He kicks him. Also, Suzaku is clearly the Flash. Um, like, <laughs> yeah, no, he is. Like, I, nobody should be able to move as fast as he does in real life, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's uh, he can dodge bullets, I mean. Yeah, he can dodge bullets. Like, I don't even want to. He can dodge machine gun fire <laughs> from a giant robot. It did have, like, a .05 second delay before it started shooting, to be fair. So that gives him, a, like, a little bit oh, of yeah, advantage. Oh, yeah, that too. I was talking about when he dodges, like, giant robot machine gun fire <laughs> okay uh, fair enough because <laughs> he does because he does that like more than once so let's talk a little bit about it then because it sounds like you really like suzaku because like probably I like, like one of the the biggest yeah. like conflict in the show besides like the obvious britannia fighting zero thing is the philosophical conflict between lelouch who's like i'm going to you know create a a, a resistance group get my hands dirty you know you can't you can't, I will stain my hands with evil, you know, to defeat the greater evil sort of thing. You know, the ends justify the means. Whereas Suzaku is like, you know, the ends don't justify the means. I'm going to solve the problem through the inside, you know, working to change Britannia from within. And their sort of two philosophies clashed over and over again throughout the show. And that's another aspect of the show that I really find to be fascinating. Yeah, the, the conflict between those two was one of my favorites. It's a lot like Tales of Vesperia, if you ever played that I game haven't. it's it's basically the first two thirds of that game are basically just that is the entire plot is you know does do, getting your hands dirty and you know really like killing the evil is that like really the way to go or is it like should you try to change things from the inside and change like the way the laws work um and they both go about it in very interesting ways i really like the juxtaposition to like have lelouch be britannian in origin, mm-hmm. Zuzaku being Japanese, and yet they're on like opposite sides trying to do like yes. different things. I think that's really fascinating. Um, yeah, no, I, that was one of my favorite parts of the show too. Is anything to do with those two? Like, yeah, trying well, to figure out the, how to. Yeah, they sort of have like a Naruto Sasuke rivalry, in that like you know their their rivalry is the one of the big draws of the show, although better executed. It than is the better executed. Naruto Sasuke rivalry. It's also less irritating at like any point. <laughs> Naruto's not that bad. No, it's not that. It's just that Sasuke and Naruto's thing can be kind of irritating. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Trend, what are your thoughts on Suzaku versus Lelouch? Um, <laughs> I mean, I can't really say much than what you already have. I mean, well, then let's talk about this real quick. Who do you side with personally? Because I'm, I'm gonna say I, I prefer Lelouch's philosophy over Suzaku's because I kind of find Suzaku to be kind of hypocritical in that he's talking about how like. Oh, you know, you can't you can't do bad things, you know, blah blah blah. And yet, you know, he's in the military and like he's asked to do these bad things by Britannia because Britannia is kind of a corrupt government. Like when they're uh, when they're dealing with the JLF ship and uh, and uh, Suzaku's ordered to like shoot anyone that tries to flee or you know anyone on sight or those yeah. sorts of things, and he sort of like you know gets that uh, you know face. But he's like, yes, sir. You know he has to follow the orders. So yeah, that, that actually gets brought up in the show about uh, them calling each other kind of hypocritical, and uh, well, actually more just uh, Zaku being a hypocrite in what he does. And I, I think that's um, 
I, I tend to side more with Lelouch, I think, as well, because uh, while uh, Zuzaku's plan, it, it does contain action, but also contains, uh, you know, kind of a bit of having to talk and try to... It, it, it seems like it's a bit harder to change people mi- people sheeple's minds <laughs> sheeple's, sheeple's uh, oh, that's pretty accurate actually <laughs> oh yeah yeah but at the same time like in the first in the second episode actually it is you see lelouch when he's being chased by suzaku and the uh, lancelot and he shoots like a bunch of buildings to distract him and like a lady falls from the roof and suzaku goes to catch him her i should say you know so it's like suzaku is certainly more moral in a lot of ways than lelouch you know but at the same time like you say because Lelouch, like, admits that what he's doing is evil, you know, but committing evil to do the greater evil, you know, the ends justify the means sort of thing. I feel like he's more honest with what he's doing, where Suzaku, like, says, no, I'm going to be better than you. I'm not going to do what you do. But he does c- become kind of a hypocrite, especially in R2, although we're not going to get to that today. Yeah, Lelouch is just not afraid to do what is needed to get things done. He, he will go to almost any lengths. Um but well, yet he has morals. He does have morals, which I find really interesting for somebody who's, like, so sociopathic in other areas of his life. But just talk real quick why you like Suzaku, I guess. I mean, his philosophy. as a philosophy, as a philosophical standpoint, I tend to be more on Lelouch, Lelouch's side. Though, with Suzaku, the point of it is... The whole crux of the argument, and like I said, this was also done in Tales of Vesperia, which I played over the summer. So it's I've kind of gotten this story twice. Um, the crux of it is Lelouch is like a short-term fix because he'll get it done, like right now. Like mm-hmm. that guy sucks, so he shoots him in the head, and that guy's dead, and then the, that's not a problem anymore. But that is that doesn't generate a long term a lot of long term solutions. That just creates a lot of that creates other problems that spin out of that, and then you just kind of have to keep going, solving these problems with very quick short term solutions. Versus Uzaku, who, yes, things suck now, but things probably. But if his plan goes correctly, things won't suck in the future, and that will that less sucking will last longer. Yeah, because several times, especially later in the show, Lelouch says, you know, we can't stop now, you know, for the sake of all those who have died to get here, you know, I have to keep going. The only path left to me is forward. You know, that's a direct quote. Uh, And one thing I do really love about the whole philosophy thing is that the show does not definitively say Lelouch is right or Suzaku is right. You know, it certainly lends credence to both their arguments to their actions in the show, but it lets the audience decide which one is right, you know, and I think that's really important for this sort of dilemma to work uh yeah especially because they kind of it never really feels like it resolves though well between the two of them because they kind of both once lose again by the end of once the again season? because this is only half the show yeah um, by by the by the end of r2 they do sort of find uh, an agreement i'll oh, say that okay. um, yeah, you were but it's not in the way you'd expect <laughs> probably almost no. certainly yeah we're, we're <laughs> Ordering here on the story. <laughs> well, I can't know. I haven't watched R2 yet. It's <laughs> true. So we'll 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 try not to do any R2 spoilers on here for sure. Yeah, going back to that quote, it, didn't he say that basically right after he blew up a lot of people? Like, wasn't that the You mean the only path left to me is forward? I think. Um, or like uh, because of all the people who uh, we can't stop now because of all the people. Oh, I think no, it was no, it was something else. It was mm-hmm. after um he was getting depressed because Shirley's dad died in the, oh, yeah. in the mountain oh, yeah. slide, I think. Uh, yeah. Again, spoilers. Yeah, well, the whole show. We, so yeah. We're going to be talking about Just so you thing. know, Shredded Cells is a podcast where we spoil the shows we talk oh, okay. about. So yeah, don't be afraid to talk about spoilers for R1, we not R2. To, we have to talk about the show somehow. Oh, we yeah, can't talk yeah. about the entire season. No spoilers. That's exactly. Um, he also says something kind of similar after the whole, um, oh, what's the princess's name? Uh, uh Oh, um, Euphemia. Yeah, after he does that, which I almost punched the screen when he did that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Um, <laughs> like, oh why God. would you say those things? Yeah, why we'll, wouldn't you just we'll, jokingly say make we'll me We'll talk a about, like, the last few episodes because those are where things, like, really start getting good, but, in my but opinion. But it was an accident. I <laughs> it was almost an accident. punched it truly, the screen. It truly was an accident. It was an accident. But why would you, like, no. It was, a poor, it was a poor joke to be making. You should have just been like, oh, I could just order you to make me a sandwich. And then she makes him a sandwich, and nobody has to get massacred. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, it, it, exactly. It was an accident in the end. Although, talking about that, um, my uh, one of my favorite scenes, like, uh, like death scenes in any anime, is the next episode where she's on her bedside, and we're cutting between her talking about, you know, are the oh, Japanese people that. okay? You know, cutting with the 
the people at the Zeros rally saying, you know, she's a bitch, she's a demon, yeah. blah, blah, blah. I love that. You know, and, oh. like, with them chanting, zero, zero, as she's, like, dying, and Shizaka's, like, crying. And, oh actually, my God. the whole sequence is probably my, the, my favorite part yeah, of the whole season. That made my heart break just a little bit. Oh, it, like, I actually really it hurt. Like, I actually really liked her, and I liked her... You know, Suzaku and I shipped them and I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so you really were heartbroken. I was then. upset. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, her. no, this show does not allow for you to be happy, Andrew. Uh, I, you couldn't have been as upset as Nina, though. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, Nina. Uh, yeah. The maybe. craziest character in the whole show. Okay, maybe mm. not. Maybe we shouldn't go into her. And yeah. There's certain actions that she took. Yeah. Uh, you know what we were talking about when we were talking about episode 12 now with Nina? No? Okay. Uh, okay no, just remind me really quick. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of characters on the show. I'm sorry. I was trying to keep everybody's faces straight. Uh, Nina, who's the one who develops the uh, the bomb and is in oh, love with Euphemia. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and a table in episode 12. Yeah, because she, she wasn't <laughs> like super, super, super relevant until oh, the end. Not really, no. And then I was like, oh, 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 oh. Um, she, she was also like really racist too. Yeah. Yeah. She was. So um, she was not a good, she was not a good character at all. Well, like, not, not a bad character, but not well, a likable character. Not a likable character, yeah. Certainly. But I don't think she was really that good of a character either. She didn't really have any development but, at all. She just went from it's like, oh, I was in love with this princess. Now I'm going to go build a bomb well, for but, her. But it was established, like, for Lloyd, when he came to that party, saw her working on something, you know, nuclear-related, you know, in the in her computer. And she is important, more important in the second season, you know, oh, for yeah. obvious reasons. So she serves her purpose in the show. Um, although I really, even though she gets some redemption near the end of R2, I still hate her. I'm not going to lie. But that is neither here nor there. Um, talking about um, the early part of the show, one thing that you know, Code Geass does get some criticism for, and perhaps legitimately so, is it has these really serious episodes with this war and this conflict Which and I these love. epic philosophies and these tactics. Which and I then love. we have the occasional goofy filler episode Which at I the hate. high school. Which I really, really, really <laughs> hate. Like, seriously, if Shirley's whole thing didn't become actually plot relevant, I would have just been so angry at this show. Well, but it did become plot relevant. Because that whole, like, love... Like, oh, will they, won't they? Goofy high school love triangle thing going on. I was like, really? This is not the show to be doing this, and this is the least interesting plot thread in this show. But I I defend it in two ways, because although they they do aren't, like, the best episodes, obviously my favorite episodes are, like, the ones that yeah. involve the tactics and Actually, stuff. the show defends it pretty well, too. Um, but, uh, but for one, like, the relationship with Shirley, like, it's important because a lot of people compare Lelouch to Light Yagami from Death Note for a lot of reasons. They're mm. both very sociopathic intelligent, evil. sociopathic villain protagonists. Yeah. But whereas Light has like no morality and is willing to cast away anyone, Lelouch actually does have friends and you know Nunnally and people he does legitimately care about, and yeah. he does doubt his actions, like when uh, Shirley's dad is killed by accident in the mudslide that he caused. Like, cost like, of war. Like, he, you know, he actually, you know, gets depressed about it, you know. So I like that, and I think it's necessary for him to have human interactions and things that ground him in the quote-unquote real world outside of the, uh, you know, outside of his battle with Britannia. Things to ground him in his humanity, which is what the high school episodes do. I agree, but, A, high school episodes come across as, well, hey, look, all the main characters are going to school together because this is main character school. Of course Seriously, it is. Seriously, like, they just started <laughs> throwing everybody at it. Like, Suzaku starts going there, uh... Colin starts going there. Well, and Colin was always there. She was yeah. always there, but she wasn't like really, really there. She, she was just came like, back. After she came back because she was busy fighting a revolution. Yeah. And <laughs> I know. also really like Colin. It, um, it never reminds me of that festival episode in SR2. I'm not get, again, not getting to it. It gets even more ridiculous yeah. with all the characters. Basically, my opinion of R2 is it takes everything that was Code Geass Season 1 and amplifies it. So... The tactics and the action and the robot battles and the epicness of the show is all increased tenfold. I like those things. But the leaps in logic and like the fan service and some of the silliness in the silly episodes also gets increased tenfold. Yeah, so it's, I noticed the fan service went up just when I watched the first episode and what they did to Colin. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm so, so sorry. But both, that will be for the R2 podcast. I want to talk about R2 so bad because it's so good. Fine. We'll get to it it's later. It's like when you watch Clannad and you just really want to talk about <laughs> after story oh, being... It really just can't. The whole podcast oh. became 
Wait after for after story. story. <laughs> Have you seen Clonad? Yeah. Is it one of your favorites as well? Mm-hmm. Yep. It's just the sadness. All though. the tears. Oh, sadness. <laughs> but uh, uh, talking about, um, I guess we could talk about some characters in the show because, like you mentioned, Colin just oh, now, Colin. and I do like Colin. You know, she. Uh, She's like, you know, Zero's right hand man and sort of serves as, you know, this sort of like a, not really a love triangle, but she's kind of into Zero, you know, and then C2 kind of has something going on there. And then Shirley right. likes Lelouch. So he's got some ladies going after him. He does, but he's just too sociopathic to like actually care. Yeah, we, well, we call him, though, it's more of a, a respect thing uh, of having and being drawn to his natural leadership and him and his passion for taking Japan back. Right. It, it, and that's something that they have in common, and that's how they build their relationship. Right. At least with the whole Zero. And persona. the fact that she is, you know, the counter to Suzaku, the Black Knight's best pilot, and, you know, her fights Gurren with pilots. between the, the Gurren and the, the, the Lancelot are, like, the best fights in the, the show. Gurren. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. so you're. So this is Gurren Lagan now, so. Except not. Except <laughs> when are we going to do a drill break, somebody? <laughs> huh? yeah, yeah, just just waiting for that uh, Pierce the Heavens quote. Yeah, we're yeah. just waiting, waiting for, for you to, you know. But she has a laser Pierce. arm. And I was totally pro that, actually. Um, I really love the laser arm. I'm like, nope, no, you crush, you, you grab onto robots and you, like, explode them because, yes. Because yes, yeah, and then we also have like um, a character I actually like, even though he doesn't get a lot of you know play in the show necessarily, is Ogi, who is really like the guy who's like the really pretty nice guy and the the leader, but more of like oh, yeah. he's the everyman. You know, he can't do what Zero can do. I, you know? I really liked him and his plot thread with uh, that Britannian girl that yeah. he kind of kidnapped. Though Valetta. got a little weird for parts of it. I actually really liked um, and kind of wish it paid off more in the end. Uh, it pays off more in R2. I'll leave it at that. Has everything <laughs> pays off more in R2. God. You've only seen half the show. God. Cough, cough. Shh. It's like seasons. <laughs> seasons are things in how TV shows work. Ugh. Well, right. but in this case, it's not like, like with American TV shows. You know, sometimes they, like, make it so every season, like, could this could be the last season of our show, you know, well, because we could scared, get canceled. So, like, they're going to get canceled. In the case of Code Geass, they obviously knew they were going to do season two. Well, or else yeah, they otherwise, I would just... Otherwise, this would not go down <laughs> as a very good show in history. <laughs> no, it would not. Um, another character I really like who is voiced by oh, uh, Crispin Freeman, actually, one of my favorite voice actors, Jeremiah Gutwald. Oh. He's so much fun to watch because he's so over the top. The green-haired guy, yeah. orange boy. Yeah. That guy. I, he, I did not expect that plot thread to come back. Um, he after. did, and he was crazy, and I loved it because Crispin Freeman just is overacting, and it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. One of my favorite quotes in the entire show is when uh, Lelouch says, is that you, uh, orange boy? He just goes, oh, like he freaks out. He's just, and he's like, please let me kill you. Like so calm about it. <laughs> <laughs> I beg you, please die or yeah. something like or that. Or something like that. Like, please, I don't know. Or yeah. please die. I don't know. Yeah, so that's great, obviously. Um, talk about some of the other people in the student council, I suppose. Uh, Millie is just really manipulative and kind of high on her power as the student body president, I think. Yeah, mm. and then she's also got uh, the guy that drives the motorcycle Rivel. wrapped around her, her finger. So Yeah, poor Rivel. I feel <laughs> I, sorry for I him. I do feel bad, although she got engaged to my other favorite character. Oh, so. Lloyd? Oh. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd has has to be my personal favorite. I love oh, those yeah. two. Characters. Actually, just all three of them, like Suzaku, Lloyd, and what's the girl's name? Uh, uh, oh, um, the, the assistant to Lloyd, you mean? Yeah. I do forget oh, her yeah. name. But I, I, I love really all three of them because uh, I think they're, like, just fun to watch together. Yeah. Well, and I like that Lloyd is uh, one of those characters who is not afraid to admit that he is, like, a sociopath for the sake of science. Like, he does have morality. Science. He is isn't interested in women, except for the purposes of getting a robot. You know, robot. <laughs> I, you know what that though? Like his his entire justification, like oh, I don't want to get married, but for robot, I will. I'm like, <laughs> you no, know no, you, you. I actually empathize with you on a deep personal level. Because um, anything for robot. Anything for a robot. Although, but he should have ended up with the other nerdy girl. Like, they were so cute together, even though she's, like, kind of insane. Are you saying Lloyd and, uh, and, um... Yeah, he clearly um, has feelings for her, which is, like, impressive, so... 
Oh, well, you mean the chick in the yeah his assistant? No, not the no, not no. the assistant. Um, you mean Nina? Nina? Nina. Oh, yeah, well, they, oh no, he clearly, that, I don't think clearly, there has, was no romance there though. Yeah, and plus, what? you know, I don't think well, not Lloyd would be Nina's type. No. Yeah, and also there's a big age gap there. As well. there's a big so he's marrying the student council president. He doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Um, and uh, another character I really love that's introduced like. You know, midway through the early part of the show is Cornelia, uh, who is much more competent than some of her other siblings in the royal family, and I love her for that. Like the episode where um, she purposely recreates the same situation that was at Clovis's event, you know, to draw Zero in, and she basically totally trounces him in his you know game of tactics, like and almost catches him. Like I love her for that, and the fact that she's a badass piloting her mech, you know, going on the front lines, all those things make her pretty awesome. I don't know. Anyone else have strong thoughts on Cornelia? Uh, I liked her. Um, she was like Let's see one of the, like you said, one of the more competent. That's it. Cecile. That's Cecile. the name of the uh, assistant. Yeah. God, there are so many oh. characters in this show. There uh, really are. <laughs> Cornelia was good. Um, she presented a really good, like, enemy for Lelouch because she was, like, smart enough to, like, keep up with him in a lot of ways. So mm-hmm. I thought that was, like, impressive because, like, Clovis was an idiot. So... Right. He, and, he, he got no development at all. He like, didn't get any development. He didn't need development. He was yeah. there to get shot in episode two. Yeah, no, that was, like, his... That was, he, w- he was there for the plot. He was not there for character, which is fine, whatever. Because Cordelia comes in and she gets a lot of stuff going on. And, yeah. I guess talking about one sort of interesting thing in the show, what was everyone's reactions when... Um, you know, Lelouch uh, does like his first major act of zero, saves Suzaku's life in the parade, uh, and but then is like, you know, join us, Suzaku. Obviously, Britannia is evil, and that's where Suzaku basically is like, no, I'm gonna go face my court martial. Mm-hmm. You know, the ends don't justify the means. You know, I'm gonna change things from within. Blah blah blah. You know, if that's if that's what they've set out for me, so be it. You know, and. I don't even remember my first time watching the show, but I'm sure I was, like, really confused at that because it's like, dude, I mean, I understand, like, being a moral knight and all that, but you're taken to, like, the nth degree here. (laughs) I don't know. It's interesting, though, to think about that in context of what we learn later, that basically Suzaku has a death wish and wants to die, you know, for what the crime he committed, you know, killing his father, which really brought an interesting aspect to his character, I think. I actually love that, and... I like love that plot twist because I did not see that coming like even a little bit, mm-hmm. and also it totally justified Mal's character who I was like, where oh. where is this going? Like this seems like completely random other than giving C two some development. Yeah. yeah well, well, I mean, I liked Mal and I wanted him to become kind of a bigger villain than he was. So, what were you gonna say, Trenton? Uh, I don't. I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, talking about Mal though, like I actually really like those episodes because like. One of the titles for the episode was Gios versus Gios. Like, the mind games that they play with each other, the fact that Lelouch has to counteract the fact that he can read his mind, and he's that's how he wins battles is with thinking, so, like, he's the perfect opponent for him. I know. I love that. So yeah. I was kind of hoping they would do more with him. Right. Like he would be kind of like, oh, my God, is that going to be the main villain? That would be cool. Nah. Yeah. Their entire sort of um, relationship and how they interact with each other, they, they just bounced off each other very well, and yeah. it was, like, very like kind of intense because you don't know what's going to happen next like what uh mal is going to pull out of his sleeve and uh and i don't know if uh, anyone's here watched has watched um the uh, um bridge series yeah they've written uh, code meant yeah code meant. That's I, I love that show uh, I have to, it, it, I their interaction yeah, their interaction good. in there in, in that show is so much better than how they actually uh, <laughs> do it in the Show. Show. Basically, uh, he takes both Lelouch and Suzaku and makes them both completely idiots, and it's hilarious. I can see yeah. that. Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Suzaku so no. talks like this, and then <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, the one thing I will say with the Mal episode, like I love the part where he um, he tricks him with the video screen that he pre-recorded oh, the I message. Um, how a little, Mal, a little bit crap. <laughs> it. It's actually less so when you rewatch it because, like, at one point, uh, Lelouch interrupts him mid-sentence. So it's like, you know, he couldn't time out exactly, like, how long Mao was yeah. going to talk. And he, when you listen to, like, the answers he's given, he's giving kind of general answers. Like, it's mm. not suspe- sus- specific usually. Mm. So it's kind of clever in that way. However, um, one kind of plot hole in the show is that Mao gets shot, like, a dozen times. I know. And then comes back the next episode. I was like, oh, so you're not. 
oh, cool. So you are going to be the main villain of the show now. No. And then he wasn't. Yeah, because they say Britannia medical technology did it, but it's, like if it's really that good, then no soldier in the show should die. Well, why does anybody <laughs> die in this show? Uh, why did Clovis die? He's just like uh, he only you, took one bullet. Like you, only, uh, like you told them to shoot, not to kill. Like, and it, Luke's just like, you know, in his mind, he's like, oh, just like wait, that's true. Really? Like, that's like the only time like you got me there, Mal. You got me there. I didn't. He, no, it's Lucius' mind. I did not know that the Mike Gia suddenly became a genie today. Yeah. Like the one time. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. And the, the fact in that episode that like Lelouch and Suzaku work together and Lelouch cast the Gias on himself to make him forget his plan in order to beat Mal. Like that, that was, was so cool. That was really cool. Yeah. And also, I mean, I just, it was, it was an episode like that, that like you see them working together, being friends again. And you're like, no, like this, this should work. Like, Suzaku should totally join Lelouch's army. It would be awesome. And yeah. then that, that just that does not that happen. That does not happen. <laughs> <laughs> just no. Yeah. yeah also, yeah. talking about the show, I'm guessing everyone here watched the dub of the show. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, personally, I think this is, like, a really, really great dub because it has a lot of really famous and great voice actors in it. Uh, Johnny Young Bosch as a Lelouch in what I personally consider to be his best role, even though I love his role as Vash and Trigun. His portrayal of Lelouch is so awesome. Uh, Johnny Young Bosch, Yuri Lowenthal, the voice of Simone from Gurren Lagann is Suzaku. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, Steve Blum is in the show, Steve Jameson Blum Price, uh, Troy Baker as Schneisel, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn as Cornelia, uh, Michael McConaughey as the Emperor, Vic Mignogna is in it, Travis Willingham, Crispin Freeman. Like, it just had an all-star cast, basically. They really spent awesome. a lot of money on this. Uh, no, they did. They threw yeah, a lot of money. Hold out all the stops. Well, and cast you can tell also tell talking about that um, production level for the show. For a show that was made in 2006, which is in an era where they were do they had switched to digital, but they weren't at HD video yet. Like, that was more 2007, 2008. That they got to, like, HD uh, production quality with their animation this show looks really really good like to this day like the mech fights and the amount of movement they put into everything you can tell sunrise was very confident in this original project and put a lot of passion and money into it, it really did um especially like i didn't know it was an original project but like oh yeah which is a rarity in that, i was about to say like because normally that doesn't like unless it's done by trigger but <laughs> like or gynax they or gynax like yeah like unless one of um, unless one of those two is doing it i'm like well yeah, that doesn't happen a whole lot. Um, yeah, no, so I love that. And I also love um, the music to the show is actually done by two people, Kotaro Nakagawa and Hitomi Kuroshi. And I actually, I've downloaded the soundtrack to my iPod. And, uh, like, it's one of those soundtracks where you, like, listen to a track and it's like, oh, this played at this epic moment in the show or this played at this epic moment. Like, it's so ingrained in your brain and every sound, almost all of the tracks are, like, memorable in one way or another. I just love the show. Very orchestral music. It's great. Um, so talking about a different arc of the show, I suppose, um, what did you guys think of the, the hotel episode where, um, where zero sort of makes his debut with the black Knights and has that awesome speech. Then the episode, how about their nights for justice? That was really cool. Uh, yeah. Very, very <laughs> cool. It was really cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, suppose it's hard to talk in detail. I'd say like, that was awesome. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. I could say some things. I thought it was interesting that like he established this order of like revolutionaries that are like for justice and like equality and like all of these buzzwords. Yeah. All these buzzwords. But like I was staring at it. I'm like, do you really believe that? Or are you just saying that to get the people on your side? Uh, it, make, it makes you question because he says that it doesn't matter uh, if you're Britannian or if you're the Chinese Federation. If you oppose justice and equality, then we are going to take you down. Right. It was the Chinese Federation, right? That they were trying to make a, like, who took over the hotel in the first place? Uh, no, it wasn't the Chinese Federation. It no, was it, it was the it was Japanese the Liberation Resistance. Front. Right, it was the Liberation Japanese Liberation yeah. Front, but, like, a radical sect. Like, the rest of the group, Toto and them, did not approve of it. Yeah. So he formed the Black Knights out of them and then decided to just conquer Right, the yeah. revolutionaries that right. he that were fighting. The and there was, he's actually trying to count. That was the battle at Narita, which is where he they, that was on the mountain where they collapsed yeah. the mountain. That part was really cool. Um, yeah. Collapsing the mountain was a cool idea, though. I like the battle of Naruto. That was really cool. It was a really pivotal moment in the show. I think, um, especially acquiring like the Japanese Liberation Front, like is like that really started them working together finally. Right, but well, not really together, just more against Britannia. More against Britannia. Well, they slowly worked it out. Um, but the one problem I have with that whole section of the show is because 
and this was it was very jarring when I watched the when I when you watch them all at once because you're watching it, and then you're like, oh my god, is Suzaku and you know, I mean, they're not actually gonna die because they're both main characters, but like, uh, Lelouch and Suzaku were like in the Lancelot, and then Lelouch uses his Gios on Suzaku, like commands him to live, and then the next episode is. Hey, we're on this island. Yeah, yeah you're skipping ahead a little bit. That's uh Oh, is that different? No, I thought that was the same. No, Narita is where um where uh, Suzaku has Lelouch cornered and C2 touches the mech and like gives oh, him those weird memories. Yeah, sorry, I'm confusing battles and forest areas. <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry. There's a couple of those aren't there. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I am skipping ahead. They do kind of I they troll you in the show like they do he, sometimes. He, a he lot. says uh he says C2's name and there's always that drop of water. When he says her name, so you never actually hear yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then like, he uses that against Mal. They're like, "I know her name," and he freaks out. <laughs> um, and th- there's also the battle at the with the JLF in the harbor where um, Lelouch uh, gets knocked unconscious, and Shirley sees his face, and then she shoots Valletta, you know, who's there as well. And that starts her whole kind of arc where she gets caught up with Mal, and Lelouch has to, uh, you know, uses Gios on her to make her forget. You know, which I think is important because it shows that, like, Lelouch really does care about her, you know, even though he may not. And it's like, you know, I'm going to uh, – the best way to uh, to help you is to distance myself from you, you know, because I don't want to ca- get to get caught up in all this craziness, you know. And that's – it's really kind of heartbreaking to see her after that being like, who's Lulu, you know, after she had just spilled her so guts about how much she loved him. this show. It's like true. Valletta, Valletta gets amnesia, but in that like like right around like the same time too, and I'm like, oh. But Shirley got her amnesia from Gios. Valletta's was just more. I got shot. I got shot in the head, so that means that I'm not dead. I'm totally fine, but I don't remember anything. So that's what getting shot in the head to main characters means. <laughs> well, I don't think she was shot in the head. I think she, she was she, just shot. And, she was just shot in general. <laughs> and, and, and then she looked like she was just dumped, like on a beach. So probably hit her head. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and the only reason Ogi took her in was because she mentioned Zero, like, while she was mumbling unconscious. And he was kind of thinking, like, you know, should I, what should I do with her? You know, should I get rid of her? You know, because she's a Britannian, blah, blah, blah. But then they end up kind of falling in love, you know. And, of course, that doesn't last because, you know, no one is allowed to be happy. Again, that's the theme nope. of the show. <laughs> no happiness for you. No happiness for you. Um, but, uh... After the Mao episodes is actually the episode where we get um, where we get Suzaku uh, storming. He's like fighting in the one against the Black Knights when they that's when they go and save Toto. They break him out of prison and like Toto joins the Black Knights and they fight against Suzaku and like almost uh, beat him and uh, and uh, and that's where Euphemia decides to uh, basically tell uh, Suzaku like how much she loves him and you know I'm gonna make you my knight blah blah blah. That sort of thing, or actually, no, that's a lie. She tells him she loves him later. That's but that's where she says, you know, he's gonna be my knight. You yeah, know? she's at the, like art gallery then. Yeah, she was yeah. gonna pick an art thing, a piece of art, because yeah. she sort of has an interesting dilemma in that, like, she's kind of a um, what do you want to call it? a figurehead princess? Like, she, she doesn't do anything. She's, she's just there to be a pretty face. She's just there to be pretty and people like her. And then Cornelia is like actually running the show. So right. But her then, be, uh, Suzaku becoming her knight is actually kind of a big step forward in his whole, like, you know, helping Britannia from within yeah. thing. Because then some of the Japanese start to look up to him as, like, you know, an honorary Britannian in 11 who's, you know, sort of working for the princess now. And, you know, they're working towards making Japan a better place and blah, blah, blah. And then there, but then there are always the, there was the people who thought he was just a traitor and. Right. There was both sides of it. Being part of the Britannia army just because. Mm-hmm. And, uh. And that's also around the part where uh, where they do have the confrontation of the island where, you know, Lelouch tells him to live and all that. Yeah, that part. And then the next episode is they're on an island right. randomly. Although, and once again, they're like, it's Suzaku just being stubborn once again because, like, they're talking about how they're shooting a missile to kill him and Zero at the same time. And Lelouch is like, you know, they're try- they don't care about your life. Why do you serve them? And he, you know, steadfastly remains with them and stuff like that that sort of makes me... I understand why he does it, but the same thing, I was like, geez, Suzaku, like, uh, really? Again, he has a death wish, though. Right. He does. So Which he is why particularly Lelouch's command to tell him to live is a, a, quite a curse mm. for him. It's like, no, you monster. <laughs> you know, because Lelouch uses, you know, the fact that now he knows Suzaku's past, like, trick him to his side. Like, you know, even though you killed your own father, you know, you say these sorts of things. And it's like, 
it's it's weird because like the, it looked like for a moment there that Suzaku was about to be swayed, and then like the guy calls him on the radio and is like, you know, hold zero there, you know, we're shooting missiles, blah blah blah, you know, and that's where actually pretty big cliffhanger there because this episode ends with like the missiles coming down and Schneisel shooting the Hadron Collider collider from his big, you know, ship thing that randomly shows up there at the end of the episode. And then they end up on the island, like you said, and it's really random, but kind of nice to get like a slowdown episode and we see Suzaku Colin and Euphemia Lelouch kind of paired up. Yeah, talk I talk to each I like other. Those pairs, especially because I didn't really ever see Suzaku and Colin like interacting much. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was really interesting because they're like both the star pilots of right. either side. And then Euphemia and Lelouch was really interesting because like their relationship's fascinating and she figures out that he's zero and. Mm hmm. Yeah, and well, it, it's, she basically says that she had it, kind of suspected it since uh, the hotel jacking when he had said, you know, you haven't changed, you fear, whatever it was. And he didn't, like, kill her, so. Yeah, there is, I have seen some people talk about this. There's a shot where, like, um, she's sitting there, like, naked with her, with his coat around her, and her clothes are sitting off to dry, and he's, like, you know, behind her, talking to her, not looking at her or whatever. And some people seem to think that that means like that they went and had sex or something because there's kind of a romance thing there, but Ooh, I never weird. saw that. It's kind of incesty. Yeah. And by yeah. kind of, I mean yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and by that, I mean, I mean, like, because they do the same thing, kind of, sort of, with uh, because when Suzaku finds Colin, she's taking a bath. I'm like, of course she is, because well, poor yes. Colin but does fan service. They, they need to keep Colin. them interested throughout, you know, all the slow bits. So. <laughs> yes, keep those Japanese viewers interested. Uh, I meant just the audience in general. Any male, probably any male and some female audience members, you know. <laughs> of, well, but of well, course. Well, yeah, because then, then she ends up running at him, and then he ends up wrestling her to the ground, and she's not even wearing any clothes still, and I'm like, all the awkward. Thank you, show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's but a Zuzak- Props to Zaku. He just doesn't care. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He doesn't really talk about it much. <laughs> he does not. Well, he I, he and Euphemia clearly have a thing. Well, yes. Mm-hmm. I also liked how um, they sort of cut between the two of them, and Suzaku and Colin, of course, were doing actually a great job at surviving. And then Lush, you know, is, awesome. is struggling because He's one naked. thing throughout the show is shown: he can't run, he can't do anything physical for very long at he all. He really can't. He can't pilot giant robots very well. Well, it, once he gets the Shinkiro, he he's, does pretty good. Well, that's because that thing's just OP. It's not him <laughs> being good at his job. It's that thing being really good at its job. <laughs> I suppose. And those cannons are stupid. Although, to be fair, like when he, whenever he fought with Suzaku, he was always in generic mech number one. Like He, he didn't get a special mech until he got that one. So he couldn't really compete on their level at all. Um, but I liked sort of the comedy that played off there. And then we kind of had something that's kind of important with like the Gias uh, ruins there. And... Um, and that's where he actually finds the robot. You know, that's the first one we see in the show that can fly, the first nightmare that can fly. Uh, so that's a pretty interesting episode. You know, kind of unfortunate, once again, like you can see that Lelouch and Euphemia like want to cooperate and get along, but then nothing ever goes their way because the whole exchange between Colin and Euphemia, of course, ended in, you know, disaster. Mm. <laughs> because, of course. Um. And that's about the time after Kyushu we kind of get into the last arc of the show where we really start focusing on Euphemia. And I think around uh, – well, actually, then is the – I'm lied about that. That's the part with uh, – where did I have it written down here? Kyushu. That's where the, the, those guys come from, the Chinese Federation. The Japanese guys are totally allied with them. And uh, that's where Suzaku is, like, fighting and his, like, energy filler is draining down. And that's where Euphemia yeah. calls him on the radio and is, like, telling I him how much you to love me. I command you to love me. And he's kind of, like, a little bit busy right now, busy. honey. Like, literally not right this minute. Like, any other time, yes. But not right now. But that's where Lelouch shows up, gives him energy filler, and the two of them basically tag team to take down also those again, guys. That's, See, once that's again. creating one of the greatest action scenes I've ever seen. Yes. It's like this, the, the music playing. And yeah, it like has an insert song there. The two, You see the two nightmares uh, side by side and blowing stuff yeah, up. Yeah, like the Black Knight and the White Knight kind right. of thing. It's really, it's really cool. And then it's also teasing you. It's like, yeah, see, this is what happens if they would work together. See, yeah, see, see, see. see. so that's no. good. And then the next episode is uh, another one of those uh, festivals, <sighs> you know. Okay. Although, gotta love those. <laughs> Clearly, the show does defend it very well because even I think it's um, Shirley says like 
she said she has a line that's like well life is really like it's not all important events some of these like filler moments are the most precious or something or other right well uh, i think I actually it might be millie saying that it justifying be it because she's saying like you know you're having a festival at a time like this when we're you know fighting against the black knights like because we're having war with the black knights is why we need happy moments like these you know yeah, and i i do agree with that it's like a meta commentary to say that like this is why the filler episodes exist <laughs> and i'm like uh well, and, i mean sh- it, on the one hand it is war. it is true that like if it was total darkness and seriousness 100 percent of the time it would be you know maybe get a little grating because I do laugh at some of those things that happen in those episodes, like the one where the cat, you know, uh, oh, yeah. the and cat got the helmet. helmet and, you know, they're chasing after it. Um, Code Mint had a lot of fun with that ad episode. I'm just going to leave it at that. I imagine they did. <laughs> but uh, but that, that else episode is also really important because Euphemia meets Nunnally there because she's undercover and they have a kind of a nice chat. And, uh, and Euphemia has this proclamation at the end about the uh, special zone of Japan you know, and Lelouch gets like really pissed at her because, like, no, Euphemia, no, that's not going to work. You know, you're going to turn the Japanese against me. I have to eliminate you. Blah blah blah. Yeah, and it's it's cutting between like Euphemia's like, see Lelouch, you know, this is going to solve all our problems. He's like, no, you're you're ruining everything, Euphemia. You know, like him. You know, you can sort of tell with Lelouch, like sometimes his eyes are like more wide open, like circly, and like he talks like. Oh, not only how are you doing today? And then when he's like, you know, when more serious mode, his eyes get more angular and he's like, you know, deep voice, like, you know, I will destroy the world and make it anew, you know, sort of thing. Um, and uh, and that, that then we get into, you know, the conflict where it's like, well, will we do the JLF, won't we? Or not JLF, but the Japanese special zone, special zone of Japan, whatever it's called, you know. Uh, all these people are going to their side. Everyone's wondering if the Black Knights are going to do it, if Zero's going to cooperate. Seems like he is. You know, he walks in there, talks about how he's going to, you know, shoot Luf- Euf- or have Euphemia shoot him by using his Gias on her because he had, like, this bamboo gun or something, mm-hmm. and it's going to turn Zero into a martyr, you know. And I, I forget his exact line there, but he had a really nice line about how, you know, people never question things, but they can't resist miracles or yeah, something yeah. like that. That was great. But then Euphemia actually convinces him, you know, says, like, I gave up my claim to the throne, you know, and we're going to, you know, you can't do this without consequences. I was going to rule. I was going to let you rule it with me. (laughs) Exactly. And, you know, Lou says, you know, you're the greatest foe I've ever faced. You know, you win. The sad, uh, and then the epic sadness begins. Yeah, it, it is so sad because, once again, it's one of those things like, you know, what if? You know, what if that had actually happened and they had created the special zone of Japan? Like, would that have worked out for the best in the end? You know? Probably not. But Maybe not. But. Probably not. But you, it makes you dream, though. It does make you think. Um, and then it, that Gios, this, the, his Gios decides at that moment that it wants to be on forever. But to be fair, one... They did see that with... Now, like, that that's a consequence of this. Yeah, and then they had talked about it. Like, at one point, your Gias becomes impossible to control. And earlier on, uh, you know, um, what's her name? C2, will, like, had, like, a flash. And she was like, no, not yet, you know. And she, like, collapsed. And Lelouch, like, you know, started feeling something, too. And was, like, gripping his eye, you know. And then he talked with Euphemia. And it's they do it clever, you know. They're showing, like, his back. It's, like, his back, Euphemia's front. And he's like... You know, oh, no, what are you saying, Lelouch? You know, you couldn't command me to do anything. I was like, oh, no, you'd find you couldn't resist anything. I said, for example, he turns his head. If I told you, you know, to shoot the Japanese, you couldn't do anything about it. And you see the zoom in into the eye. And he's like, oh, God. Um, what did I done do? And it's the worst because Euphemia's like, resists it for a few seconds. Like, no, how could I do such a thing? Blah, blah, blah. But then it takes over. Yeah. And she goes and does and it. And she runs off and still just as happily and bubbly as ever just murdering everybody basically and she she sounds so innocent she goes if i have to murder the japanese i'm like no <laughs> yes oh, no all of you who are japanese could you please die oh. that'd be really cool um it was a, but uh what i also like about that is that it adds another factor almost kind of another problem for Lelouch to work around after that because he, he has to be careful now with his geos and he can't yes. He he can only use it on somebody once, so he has to start wearing these special contacts in order to blend, still blend in, and mm-hmm. it, it, it's getting a little harder to 
uh, kind of keep up this whole yeah. game. Well, I think it was something like C2 asked him about it. He was like, no, I didn't use the power. Like, the power used me. Like, something like that. You know, he was, this time, he, he miscalculated, um, as it were. Yeah. He would, it, but the interesting part about this is this shows how kind of far Lulu's just gone. Because he, I'll bet he does care. Like, oh, he's he, very upset he, about it. He grieves about but it. But he is not excessively upset about it. He, like, keeps going. He's like, no. How can I use this to my advantage? Well, now? what 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 kills you is uh, he's there seeing Euphemia starting to shoot everybody, and he's like, you know, oh god, what if what's that, what have I done? Blah blah blah. And then one of the like an old woman who's like been shot is like, Zero, you have to save us. You're he's our like, only hope. And he's like, say thinking in his head like, No, stop it! I'm not the savior you think I am. You know, you're the only one who can do it. You know, and he. He sort of like begrudgingly realizes if this is the situation, the only thing for me to do is to. I think he even says that like the the best the best thing we can do to take it to take advantage of Euphemia's sacrifice is to you know use this to our advantage, you know, and um, and it's in the next episode I think where um, he actually he shoots her and he says you know farewell Euphemia you may have been the first girl I ever loved, and of course Suzaku is watching it. And it's in these last few episodes um, that I really feel like Yuri Lowenthal, that Simone, like, screaming yeah. intensity comes through. Yeah. And it's awesome. I actually really, really like Suzak. Like, I really think that – because everything he does in these last couple episodes, I feel is totally justified. I'm like, no, no, I'm on your side still, man. Yeah, I mean, you can't help <laughs> you. but – Wherever you fall on the Lelouch Suzaku argument here, you can't help but feel bad for him in those he, last few episodes. Because that, because like you said, that death scene with uh, Euphemia, Euphemia, it's just is one, like one of the best done things. Yeah, because it's, it's the worst where she says like, "Are the Japanese people happy?" And he's like, "You don't remember?" And he lies to her. Yeah, and it's, like, it's gonna oh, be great. It's cross cutting back and forth. It's, it's so good. It's gonna be great. And the music there too. And then you know. She her heart line goes out and he like starts crying even harder like no Yuffie Yuffie you know zero 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 ah I love that scene to death um, and uh, and that's also where he makes you th- realize like that while well, Lelouch or not Lelouch um, Suzaku has been intense and like fighting you know you know strong before it's nothing compared to now when he's like you know he's like screaming at Khan like out of my way you know and doing all these things and. I love it, and uh, and later in that episode, he calls Lelouch and is like, Lelouch, you know, tell Millie and everyone in the student council to look away from the sky tonight. I'm going to become a murderer, okay. you know, in the skies of Japan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dist- – all the lights in the sky are my enemies. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you know, Lloyd is like, in your state of mind, I don't think you should be pining the lance on it. He just punches it. I love that. And it's just like, <laughs> no. I'm doing this. Like, because usually Lloyd's kind of like, silly, haha, you know, mad scientist sort of thing. And yeah. then I'm it's a like, mad scientist. No, no, I'm not taking any of your shit today, Lloyd. No. <laughs> I'm doing this. I'm going to murder everybody. Yeah, especially Zero. Basically. Mostly Zero. Mostly Zero. You know, but like you said, the, fa- the, the scene where Lelouch is grieving over that and C2 kind of comforts him, like, that's really important to me. Like, comparing Lelouch to Light, like, Lelouch is honestly one of my favorite characters in all of anime. Uh, part of that being that he. He is. Uh, he does these evil things, and you can see him as a evil dude. But at the same mm-hmm. time, he does this, all all these things for not only sake. You know, he cares legitimately about his friends. You know, he does get sad when certain people close to him die. You know, or when he sees the repercussions of his actions. You know, so the fact that they show that keeps him as a human being rather than just as a monster, and that's really important. They do humanize him very well. That's important. Yeah. Except then, at the end of the episode, he has probably one of his most evil moments where he collapses. Uh, to- the Tokyo settlement, you know, through the yeah, the floor thing, and it gives the, the evil laugh. That's great. Just the, that's just the great evil's moment. laugh, and I was like, "Wow, you just don't you know, even have any subtext sa- anymore. <laughs> you were just the evil saying something about uh, Suzaku. Oh, you, after all, we are friends, Suzaku. You you can come challenge me." I, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Wow, you've either had a mental breakdown or yeah. you just decided to drop." Probably off partially text. mental breakdown, yeah, honestly. Because after everything you just uh, that he's gone through, I mean, he, he's just. I think the last string just kind of snaps for that moment, and he just goes all out. Yeah. And he also couldn't help but feel bad for Cornelia in that episode because she like locks herself up in her room for a while because she yeah. loved Yuffie, Yuffie to death. Everybody loved Yuffie to death. Yeah. Uh, not everyone. Well, not everyone, I, but like... I do think some fans kind of think she's a little preachy, you know? So there's some criticism of her, I think, online, but personally I do find her... She's kind of like 
kind of like not only like a core of innocence, you know, and naivete huh. and purity she, and all that. She is. Well, also, like, I meant like every character in the show. Oh, like, pretty yeah. much everybody in the show likes her. Right. And, uh, and this is around the time, like, a bunch of things start happening at once, you know, as one would expect from the show. Like, Valletta, you know, regains her memory, you know, goes and Randomly. shoots Ogie. You know, like and, uh, and, some dudes. and Nina, you know, comes out with the bomb at the school and all that. Yeah, because Yuffie died. And she's no, like, and I Nana have to kill Zero. Like, no, Zero. Nana kept calling Z- it's Lelouch. And he's like, hey, can we have Yuffie over? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he's <laughs> like, uh, have you no. not seen the news? And she's like, no, what happened? He's like, oh, never nothing. mind. <laughs> nothing happened. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and then you get some awesome battles there, you know, happening in the well, because they're, in the yeah, they're invading Tokyo, and you know, that's just cool. And, and just poor Nunnally throughout all of this, she has no idea. Like, yeah, what's true? But he's going creating on. a gentler world for her sake through uh, killing thousands of people, <laughs> of course. Uh, and um, and uh, that's also like uh, he goes and confronts Cornelia, you know, because ever since Clovis mentioned Cornelia, he'd been wanting to get her, you know, so he could use his Gias on her. Gets the chance by um, by using because he had used his Gias on Dalton earlier, and Dalton uh, basically destroys Cornelia's mech for him, and he's like, "What have I done?" You know, just before Lelouch blasts him away, of course. Uh, and then Cornelia's yeah. like, yeah, no, I uh, I didn't do... Uh, I didn't even know who murdered your mom, man. Yeah, I was part of her guard, you know, we were told to withdraw that day, so it just sort of deepens the mystery there. You know, if she mentioned Schneisel has something Schneisel. to do with it. Schneisel did something, yeah, Schneisel did something, and I was like, okay, Schneisel. And this is also pretty important. We get um, a new character, V2, shows up and is like, you know, Seriously, do you want to hear about all Gias? These, all these <laughs> girls just, like, these goddess things, whatever, I actually don't know what they're... But yeah. I assume that's explained. Um, yeah, they're Gias wielders, basically. But or, yeah, they all of them just start coming out of the woodwork. So well, uh, there's actually only two in the whole show, just C two and V two. That's all really? we know about. I thought there was uh, like the other, I yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, that's just those two. Like yeah, who, no. um, V two is important. Uh, you actually saw like a, a just a very quick shot of him when they were transported to the island, or okay. in one of those weird Gias montages. Wait, he was that's there. It, two. Yeah, no, that's a dude. Yeah, in um, just has very long yeah. hair. Okay, <laughs> he's also like a child. Very but yeah, this voice. is also where it kind of gets a bit uh, unstructured when it tries to explain a bit more about Gios. You know, that's this is kind of like the very beginning, hinting at what's coming for the next season. Uh, I don't know. They don't really explain Gios in that much. I mean, they, he she talks about it when like in the mouse stuff and yeah. like in the episode where he touched her while he was doing that thing to Suzaki, you saw a bit of her past, you know, but, uh, yeah. but they don't really go into the specifics of Gias until, uh, the second season. That's true. But I, I, they kind of hinted at it like overall, like, uh, about how, you know, Lelouch wasn't the only one she gave Gias to it, There was Mao and possibly others in the past, but we never hear about them. But, um, yeah, do I, I can't remember. Was it the first season or the second season that we go into C 2s past? Well, like I said, you you see a part of it um, in 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 R one, but oh right, and yeah, actually when they go to the um, back to the the island, yeah, because you, know, yeah. you see there's like, a trap. You see like clips of like all the, like a bunch of the times she died and she's burned at the stake yeah. and murdered in like World War One. Once again, though, you see that more fully expanded in R two. So yeah. you know you get a little bit. Well, of that. you get that she's immortal. I get. It. <laughs> yeah. Like all right. Well, you're immortal. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, and um, and I do. It is a little strange because at w- one point C two is like. Listen, uh, somebody's kidnapped Nanali, you know, because V2 basically kidnaps Nanali, you know, takes her away sort of thing. And she's like, I know about it because she's someone who's important to you or connected to you. I reasons now. Um, I guess I think they do say in, later on, don't they, that, like, she can she can know things about people, but only if they're connected to Gias, like, can sense things about them. So maybe because it was V2 that kidnapped Nanali, that's how she knew. I guess that's the best explanation I can think of for how she suddenly like psychically knew what was going on. Um, but yeah, Lelouch basically totally abandons the Black Knights and leaves just, the battle. Just like, um, screw this, Tokyo. 
Like, yeah. even calls the Black Knights, hey, yeah, the one guy got shot. Yeah, but oh. what about the girl in the wheelchair? What girl in the wheelchair? The girl in the wheelchair, that you, the school you captured. Uh, I don't know. We haven't really seen them, but this guy got shot. I don't care. I'll find his replacement later. Uh, oh. Yeah, and like, the, yeah. and then they start losing the Britannians, and they're all like, where is Zero? Where could he possibly he be? Because they need him to, you know, tactically command them, because they're idiots. <laughs> well, they're not idiots. Like, Toto kind of takes command, but no, he's more at the front line. No, they, they said that. They're like, there's even a line about that. They're like, he's a good military commander, but he's not as good. He's, he's not, not good as charismatic enough. and He's crazy. not as charismatic. He's not just good enough at tactics that Zero is. Like, Zero is a monster at it, basically. And uh, and we do get, like you said, the nice conf- the flashbacks with, um, with the C2, you know, at that one point. And... Um, and we see uh, her fight Jeremiah in the Shinkiro. I, th- I think it's the Shinkiro. I could be wrong on that. But that was, like, a pretty awesome, like, animation-wise, awesome little fight. And she, you know, kills herself basically to beat him. You know, yeah, but yeah. immortal, so. Yeah, but immortal, so whatever. <laughs> so whatever. Uh, and then we get uh, one of my, definitely one of my favorite scenes in the show, the last scene uh, where uh, Suzaku and Lelouch finally confront each other. Ooh. Colin watching Andy. it, you know, <laughs> shoots the mask, and they do the slow mo shot of it being him, and he's like, "I didn't want it to be you." you I didn't know? want it to be you, but he kind of figured it out because, you know, no doubt, right? <laughs> but Colin was like, "What plot twist?" Well, because he had in the third episode, he like gave her like the recorded phone call to make her think that it wasn't him when she was yeah. suspecting him. So, you know, she kind of just collapses from that and. Lelouch t- t- tries to be like, no, not only has been kidnapped, like, we have to do this, you know, and he's like, no, you know, uh, you, I know you, you know, you're going to betray the whole world the way it's betrayed you, you know, you need to be erased, blah, 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 when he's, like, pointing the gun at him, even though he's, like, shaking with rage and all that, you know, uh, probably not the best thing for Lelouch to, when he mentions Euphemia, you know, it's like, yeah, it's in the past, over and done, you know. Like, that's not the best way, you know, to get him to your side probably there, uh, Lelouch. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was just, like, done with trying to recruit. He's like, no, I'm going to find Anneli. Screw you. I don't even have time to, for you right now. Yeah. I got things to do. Oh, uh, it was pretty great where he, you know, was like, want, want to shoot me? Go ahead, you know. Place your aim on this liquid Sakuradite. To which Suzaka's like, I don't even care. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> You know, so yes, ending with the Suzaku, Lelouch, you know, cutting back and forth, cutting back and forth. You hear the gunshot, you see the shot of Nunnally, cut to credits. And I was like, no, <laughs> no, 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 you're not doing this to me. I am not taking this. <laughs> so you watch the first two episodes of so R2. So I watched the first two episodes of R2 because I'm like, nope. I kind of figured that because it really is like a ridiculous cliffhanger <laughs> when you have the episodes freely available online to go watch. Uh to put it in perspective, though, talking a little bit about R2, actually, a couple years ago, I made a video of, like, my top five Code Geass moments. Like, the top five epic Code Geass moments was the video. Uh, one of them was from this season, which was the last moment, you know, with the standoff with Lelouch and Suzaku. The rest of it, all the the four other moments were from R2. Uh, you can probably guess, since you've seen the show, which ones those would be. Just to give you an idea of how... Uh, how much more grand things get in the second season. It's pretty amazing in that regard. Um, so talking overall about the show, I guess, um, kind of tough for me to talk about season one just as a whole since I've seen season two, and season two is so intri- integral to everything else about it. Uh, but I really do like season one. You know, it's got a great premise, you know, introduces you to this uh, very interesting world, you know, has – a lot of the tactics, you know, it, compared to R2, it is a bit more smaller scale and it does allow for a bit more, you know, actual, like, tactics and, you know, more small scale things. Whereas with R2, things become so big that maybe it loses some of the finer details of that in certain respects. Um, and uh, I love the plot twist. You know, this is a show that has, like, a cliffhanger at the end of every episode, which I usually like with shows like No Game, No Life, and Attack on Titan and stuff like that. No Game, No Life was particularly good at it. It <laughs> was, indeed. Um, I love Lelouch. Is like I said, one of my favorite characters in all of anime. I like the, the conflict with him and Suzaku. The animation's amazing. The music's amazing. You can tell there's so much passion poured into this show. Uh, so it really is one of my favorites, you know, uh, but just viewing it by itself, you know, it really is like an incomplete product, the first season, because it ends on such a cliffhanger. Uh, but when you combine it with R2, it becomes this real great masterpiece, in my opinion. Uh, Trenton, what are your final thoughts? Good show. Watch it. <laughs> uh, if you don't let the 
if you well i mean if you uh, haven't seen so in your list and you're listening to this well you've just been spoiled so uh go watch it anyway it's still good yeah. don't care and andrew so. what would you say all right so i get to talk about it without seeing r2 so i get to talk about things except you saw the first two episodes well, i saw R2. the first two episodes but whatever so <laughs> but you know one of the half of the first episode was pretty inconsequential anyway so <laughs> <sighs> God, that annoyed me too. I was like, "Oh my God, I have to wait 15 minutes to figure out what happens." <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. 15 minutes! I know, poor baby. Hey, hey, I was confused those entire 15 minutes. Like, I don't even know what's going on anymore. Right. Which occasionally happens with that show. Um, no, I liked it. It was good. I felt like the show was definitely at its best when he's doing the tactics thing, or Suzaku and Lelouch are doing the you know ideology thing. But I was less intrigued by the high school plot line for pretty much the entirety of it. I'm like, oh, good. My least favorite plot line is now being like, because cause like you said, when they do those cuts, they would be like, him, they would be fighting something and then they would cut and like, oh, we're baking cookies at the student council room. Like, I just literally cannot <laughs> care less. Go back to the giant robots fighting each other for control of the nation. Talking as a film student, I think most of those are just as, um, as a way basically to cut uh, do a um, what do you Attention. want to call it? A jump in time, basically. Yeah, you know, yeah. like they're in one spot here. We're gonna cut away to something else for a short time. Cut back, and now we've changed our space and time. You know, I know, but it's still annoying. It, uh, it's a, a good, it's a good kind of contrast in a way where you know you have this battle going on, and people are dying, and then you people have some some kids at yeah. school just you know doing the it is kind of funny when thing. Lush is like doing the preparations for the festival he's like you know nobody's uh, lives are on the line here this is actually pretty easily yeah, in this comparison. Is actually, like <laughs> super easy um but i like the show i just because apparently since i haven't seen half of it <laughs> yeah, the second half of it i cannot speak to it but it has not blown me away yet there are parts especially near the end that i really liked and i was like oh my god this is true is like being on fire right Interesting. now so so you because w- like personally for me i would say like the last four episodes like from like you know euphemia dying through like the battle in tokyo and then like the final confrontation with suzaku and lelouch like that did blow me away that i was really on board with it at that point i was like yes show you were good so you were being really 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 good but it's not like the best thing like because you put it on your top 10 list a lot of people put it on their top 10 or say it's their favorite Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I just don't, it has not gotten to that point yet. Yes. But it's also like saying, well, you watch Gurren Lagann, but you didn't get to the second part where they do the time skip. So you haven't really seen Gurren Lagann. Yeah, so. well, <laughs> it is it is kind of same with that. Like, you know, it's kind of like how in Gurren Lagann they stayed on Earth and then went into space. You yeah. know, we don't, you don't go into space in Code Geass, but uh, things get much more epic. I'll but just like, leave it at that. But like. If you were just if somebody were just it would be like like I said if you just watched up to the battle tap where they defeat the Lord Gino I'm like yes that was really cool show I really like that show and you're like yeah but you haven't really seen that show yet because you have not seen that show firing on all cylinders yet mm-hmm. um you've just not scratched it so I think that's where this is going so I can't make any judgments but the first season has not like completely blown me away but I'm sure the second season which did get off to a promising start I'm not denying that because with stuff with the Emperor and Suzaku and yeah. now I'm just like regretting any of the favoritism I have <laughs> for him so whatever <laughs> yeah you'll see you'll see uh, two little other notes that I just found on here that I want to mention one um, I love 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 the Emperor's not all men are created equal uh, speech, speech from That's early on speech. in the show where he just basically like you know some are born faster foot some are born you know all these things you know Blah, blah, blah. It was just a great speech. I included on like that list I made of my favorite anime speeches. Um, and at one point near the end of the show, um, Lush said to Suzaku, like, he was like, coward, you know, you're running away. He's like, I don't have time to debate which of us is the bigger hypocrite, you know, which is, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense because in a lot of ways they do both become hypocrites, you know, in what they say and do, they and especially do. in R2. But uh, we'll see that later on, won't we? <laughs> Um, so thank you guys for being on the podcast with me, especially mm-hmm. Trenton. I know this is your first time, but I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I had fun. Good. Thanks yeah. for having me. No problem. Uh, if you listeners out there enjoyed listening to this podcast, you can email us at techheads at avwproductions.com. You can follow us on Twitter at techheadsou. You can like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on iTunes. Andrew, I see you're bobbing your head there. Are you having I've fun? I've listened <laughs> to this so many times, Alex. And like I said, you've gotten it down to such a science. I know I have, but you can, you can at least pretend to 
self-care a little bit instead of, okay, now he's putting his hands up on his chin. He's very interested. I'm listening intently, Alex. So, yeah. you know, Check us out on <laughs> iTunes. Give us ratings, reviews, that sort of thing. We'll be back in two weeks to talk about uh, Code Geass R2. Hopefully we'll get together to do some sort of uh, screening of the last few episodes because mm. that would be fun. Uh, so until next time, we'll see you later. This product is copyright AVW Productions 2014.